This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Glove Stories with Murph. We are at Huntington Valley Country Club for the eighth annual Darren Dalton Foundation Golf Tournament. What a day it has been, and uh, so many of Darren's former teammates and friends out here to support him and support his foundation. And we thought, what better way to celebrate the life and legacy of Darren Dalton than come on out here and hear stories about the great Phillies catcher. We all know what a terrific leader he was. We all know what a special team that 1993 team was. But, you know, Darren touched a lot of lives over the course of his career. And uh, we wanted to celebrate that today. So we talked to a bunch of guys as they stopped by here at the table to tell us their best glove stories of Darren Dalton. Here with Milt Thompson. And Milt, I know that you had a a special relationship with Darren. And uh, he was an affectionate guy, was he not? He sure was. You know, he's my brother. And I'm, every time we would see each other, even after we were finished playing together and stuff, he would always come up, give me a hug, and kiss me on the cheek. <laughs> and I always say he's the only man that was allowed to give me a kiss on the cheek because he was such a, per a special person and, you know, just everybody loved him. And he cared so much about people. It's funny, he had a nickname for everybody. You know, he, he nicknamed me Scooter. Mm -hmm. I guess I could run a little bit yeah. back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, so many guys mention the, the affection that he shows, uh, and myself included, been kissed by Darren Dalton and, and feel very lucky to have been. But um, he, he was not the kind of guy that you were going to say, oh, no, brother, you're not coming over here and hugging to kiss me. He, he didn't even ask. He just came over and, 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 and showed you that affection. No, you, he came over and give you the biggest hug you've ever had and tell you he loves you and he'd give you that kiss on the cheek, man. It's just... That was his way of letting you know he cared about you, you know. And uh, like I said, there's never been an, another leader on a team like Darren Dalton, and I and never will be. All right, here with Ricky Metallico. And Ricky, uh, 1995, your first full season in the big leagues. Uh, Darren Dalton is your catcher. And, uh, well, he, he, he set the law down, right? He, he most certainly did, Murph. I, I will tell you this much. When you came into that clubhouse, you knew he was the leader. R regardless if it was on field, off the field, you needed some advice, you needed some help. He was the guy that was going to be there for you. And it wasn't one of these things where you had to put a letter C on him. Right. It was one of those things where you walked in there and you knew he was the respected one. He was the godfather yeah. of the Phillies. If yeah. you want to look at it like that, he, he was the guy that you needed to go to. Well, I may have taken a misstep with Darren <laughs> at one time or another in my career. And my rookie year, I was throwing the ball well. I remember it was about two and a half months into the season and he put down a pitch. I said, no, that was it. Time out. He walks out to the mound. Now, I'm not thinking anything of it. I'm thinking, okay, he's going to just come out, talk to me, and he's, we're going to discuss what's going to happen. Well, that wasn't yeah. the case. He literally looked me in the face and said, what is your ERA with me on the mound? I, I didn't know because you don't think like that sure. as a pitcher. I said, I have no idea. He goes, zero. He goes, what is it with everybody else? I said, I don't know. He says, the rest. He just turned around, walked back to home play. I never shook him off again. <laughs> I really never shook him off again. But, but to me, that, that wasn't about putting me down. That was about him pump, pump, puffing up his chest, if mm -hmm. you will, and saying, I'm the boss on this field. Yeah. Yeah, so you threw the pitch. Do you remember the, the outcome? The outcome was a strikeout, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I remember it because I, I remember my curveball was really good that day, and I was like, I just want to put him away with a curveball. I remember Darren just fastball outside part of the play. I believe it was Gary Sheffield was the hitter. And I really wanted to throw a curveball. And nope, fastball away, boom, got him to swing and miss. And you, you have to understand something else is that when you first come up to the big leagues, you don't know anything. You really don't. You think you know everything. You think you got the world, but you don't. You, you know, you need a lot of help. And when with Darren behind the plate, and uh, people will tell you, he wasn't the greatest defensive catcher you've ever seen. He will get you strikes, though. Yeah. He knew how to talk to the umpires. He knew how to work people. And he knew exactly what he was doing on a pitch-by-pitch -pitch basis. And that's the definition of a leader right he there. Was, he, he was, in, in my eyes, he was Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Here with Larry Boa, and, you know, Larry, you have a little bit of a different perspective than obviously a lot of his teammates, uh, Darren's teammates, but uh, as a coach on that 93 team, you saw some things, and uh, one night Mitch Williams not happy with the way you guys 
manage the game, and right. the next thing you know, Darren's involved. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, he was a little upset at Jim Fergosi because they didn't bring him into. Sa- it wasn't a safe situation. It was a four-run game, but anytime that's the ninth inning, Mitch thinks he's supposed to pitch. <laughs> and and remember, like it was yesterday, we won the game, and Mitch never got in that game. And he comes in, and everyone's high-fiving, and he throws his glove in the locker, and and Dutch happened to be in there, and he looked up, and he went, oh, he said, what's this all about? Yeah, that's my inning. That's my inning. He says, "Whoa, oh, does it have Mitch Williams written on it? And he goes, that's my inning. You know it is, Dutch. And Dutch says, come here. And they went back in the trainer's room. Next thing you know, they, I mean, they were screaming. But from that day on, I mean, it was like, hey, you know what? This is for the team. It ain't about you, Mitch. It's not about Kurt Schilling. It's not about Lenny Day. It's about the Phillies. Yeah. But, but right there you can see, and as a coach, you know, when you get help like that from other players, it makes your job so much easier. And me and Vuk were the, the so-called bad guys, the good cop, bad cop guys. We were the bad cops. But when you had Dutch, you know, doing what he did, it makes your job so much easier. But it, Mitch got the message. Yeah. And it happened with Kurt Schilling, a, a similar situation that he straightened him out too. But any time you have that kind of leadership without having to go to the manager, the coaching staff, it just adds so much more to the ball club. And that's what he did for that ball club that entire year. He could care less what he hit. I don't even think he hit 230, but he was a leader back there. He was a great catcher. He played the game the right way. Yeah, and the, and the thing about that 93 team that we talk about all the time is everybody understood that at the end of the day, it was only about the Phillies. It wasn't about the individual. And, and you know what made that even special, uh, uh, Murph, is most of those guys, not all of them, were on their last leg. This yeah. was, I mean, a lot of teams released these guys, and everyone knew going in, hey, you know what, this might be your last year and everything, and no one picked us to win, and – in fact, when they were stretching, they go, oh, we're supposed to come in last this year, huh? I mean, guys would make fun of it. But that's how that team sort of got together, and, and, and they were on a mission. Yeah. And they played the game. It was perfect for this city, blue-collar city. They played hard. The fans loved them. We just came up one game short, and, but we had a blast. It was, for me as a coach, it was the best team to be around because the guys, they gave everything they had every single night. And that's all you really ask for. That's all the fans ask for. That's all managers and coaches ask for. Yeah. And those guys lived up to it. Yeah. It was pretty good from a fan perspective, too. I was it, was. One of those. it was a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Larry. All right, Murph. Well, here with Ruben Amaro Jr. And uh, Ruben, you got to know Darren at a lot of different levels <laughs> because of, you've had a lot of levels within the yeah, Phillies organization, yeah. obviously, as, as a player and then in the front office. Um, so there was an opportunity for you after you guys had been teammates years later to sit down and interview Dutch right for for a job as a matter of fact I'll remember it very very clearly we were at the Marriott Airport Airport Marriott and Ed Wade and I had a chance to sit down with him and when we were deciding you know what decision we we're going to make regarding a manager I think it was the year that we ended up hiring uh, Larry Boa and uh, we sat down with Dutch and I had talked to Ed about and he knew it because he knew Dutch very very well about his leadership skills and it was just fascinating for me and a little uncomfortable in some ways for you know this guy that used to be his team you know teammate and i was like a young buck when i came to the major leagues and now i'm interviewing him for a job to be the the manager of the philadelphia phillies and it was just a really interesting moment for me to be able to sit down and, and really an honor for me to be able to sit down with him and to have that discussion. And was, we ended up going with Larry and Larry did a tremendous job for us sure. um, and took us to kind of the next level for, with our young guys. But uh, for me to be able to sit across from him and have a discussion about him being our next manager was, uh, was, was quite a moment for me. Yeah, and, and the thing about Darren that uh, I guess you know, years later, and you're sitting in that position of power in, in, in essence. But even as a young player, when Darren was the, the, the leader of that team, he never made you feel like you weren't a teammate. You, you, were, you know, you were always right there. And that's where he made everyone feel. You're absolutely right. And, um, it, and even when I was feeling really intimidated, in 92, I was a rookie, came from another organization and was traded over and had an opportunity to play. And fortunately or unfortunately for the Phillies, I ended up playing a lot because Lenny Dykstra got hurt. And I just remember Dutch being uh, being tough, but also being really supportive. Uh, I remember there were times, 
and I understood it much, much better in 93 after I'd gone through the, the, the rookie process where I would sit down after a game, if we lost the game, and I knew I did something that I probably shouldn't have done, <laughs> that I would look over at Dutch, he'd, he'd say, hey, he'd look at me and he'd give me a look, and I knew exactly what he meant. Wow. And that's all it really took. I mean, and that was the, that was the, his ability to speak without speaking in some ways because he had that kind of a presence where you just, um, where you knew exactly where he stood and he, you knew that he loved you, but he also knew that, you also knew that, uh, you know, you could make a d better decision uh, next time. And that, that was one of the other beauties of him, uh, you know. And, uh, and that was, that was who Dutch was. Yeah. I'm a little surprised, I, and, and maybe it's because we lost him so soon, but I, I'm a little surprised he never was a manager or a coach in the big leagues because he really was throughout his playing career, and those are the guys that turn into some of the best. Yeah, right? the catchers are always the yeah. guys. The guys are watching the game from a different perspective, right? They're watching the game from the other side and, uh, and really managing the game yeah. during the course of the game much more than, than, than now. Uh, but on top of that, he, on a personal level, I remember in 97, just before he was traded, 96 and 97, I would be with him. I was kind of like the last guy standing. He and I were like the last two guys standing after a bunch of trades and things from the 93 team. Yeah. And he literally would take me out and would never say no after every single home game the entire year. <laughs> and it was just bizarre. I mean, I was like, Dutch, I can't. I can't do this. I can't do it every night. <laughs> he would take me to like Morton's like for 81 straight games. I'm like, dude, you, you can't. He said, Ruben, I'm making stupid money. <laughs> Let's eat. <laughs> We're going to eat. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we'd have like a seven course meal after the game. I probably gained like 70 pounds. <laughs> but, um, but that's who he was. And that's, um, that's what he meant to me personally. But that's what, how he meant and how people felt about him across the board. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah. And I'm here with uh, Jim Eisenreich, and uh, Jim, good to see you. And I know, you know, you have obviously have memories of Dutch when you guys were teammates in Philadelphia, but mm -hmm. it's a memory from your days in Florida that uh, you want to talk about when you guys were with the Marlins. Yeah, um, I first of all, I was the um, had the benefit of being Darren's teammate on two different teams, and naturally with the Marlins in '97, we won the World Series. Yeah. Um, but he was traded to the Marlins uh, just before the July. 31st trade deadline and when he came over uh, which was I don't know the exact date but it was one of the last couple of days of July we were in Cincinnati for a three game series and the first night was probably a Friday we lost the game it was kind of a bad game for us lost three to two or something in late inning should have won um, anyway after the after the game was over uh, you know the if you I don't know if you remember the old Cincinnati Riverfront sure, Stadium yeah. Um, there's a long tunnel from the dugout to the uh, locker room. And so right after the game, just because of the way we played, uh, Darren said, can I have everybody, the players here, right at the f steps of the dugout going to the clubhouse? No coaches. Everybody else had to go. He chased everyone out. So all he said was, I just got here, you know, a couple days, and we, we, we lose this game, and you look like a bleeping country club. Like you don't wow. even care. And so we had, we had some pretty named guys on that sure. team. So fast forward to the, cause that was it. He, that's all he said, 15 seconds, he was done. We all went, showered, took, you know, came back the next night and Darren's uh, in, in the dugout, he's, or he's in a lineup and he's playing first base. And his first at bat, he hit a broken bat little blooper over the first baseman's head. And, you know, Darren had eight surgeries on yeah. one knee and another on the other. And, and he busted his tail to second base and got a wow. double. And I think what that did, it showed the other guys that what he said the night before, right there in the dugout, he, he meant it. Yeah, he it meant wasn't, it. He wasn't just saying it. He said he, he was actually doing it, too. Yeah. That's what he believed. So it was, his, you know, he didn't know it was going to be his last chance to play, but he probably assumed it was. But it was pretty cool. And the other veterans on the team uh, fell, not, not in line perhaps, but, but respected the, it, what he was able to do. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like what he said, he meant it. Yeah. It's like, okay, let's go. And, it, you know, with Gary Sheffield and Bobby Bonilla yeah. and Charles Johnson, there's a whole list of names, you know, and here 
but that that was unbelievable. That's a great story. It's like, Thank you. That was Darren. Yeah, sure was. Thanks, Jim. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. Murph here. And the Park Sportsbook app is the official sportsbook partner of the real Philly sports fan. Bet on it all. Baseball, golf, MMA, and more. Live in-game play-by-play betting lets you bet while you watch. No better way to bet right now than the Parks Sportsbook app. The only sportsbook app backed by the number one casino in Pennsylvania and the only one I recommend. No one does live in-game play-by-play betting better. Bet the money line as it changes during the game on the Parks Sportsbook app. Plus, bet on individual player performances. In baseball, you can bet on hits, home runs, and pitcher strikeouts every inning. How about golf? You can bet on match winners, bet on leaders after rounds, and more. New customers sign up right now and get your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use promo code ACTION. Do it now. Your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use that promo code ACTION. The website has all the details. Get game previews, podcasts, and more on Twitter at Parks Sportsbook. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade, whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go, delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. Sitting here with Tommy Green, and uh, Tommy, I know you and Darren have such a special relationship uh, on and off the field, uh, certainly, but uh, on the field, as a pitcher, yeah. that relationship between pitcher and catcher that Darren had with, with you guys is certainly special, and uh, well, sometimes you guys, you really needed to lean on Darren, did you not? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I lean on him a lot, and you know, a funny story on that. Uh, was one day we were pitching, and I wasn't getting a breaking ball down. You know, I, you know, I was kind of leaving it up a little bit, gave up a hit. He comes, he comes in after the inning. We get out. I'm out to give up a run, you know, and we're we're winning or whatever. Uh, he says, "Hey, Tita," he said, "You got to bury that thing. You got to bounce it. You know, you, if, I, if with two strikes, don't be afraid to bounce. It, I'll block it. You know, I'll, you know, I'll be there for you." I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> next inning, next inning, man on third base, two outs. I get ahead and I'm up in the count, two strikes. The guy he puts down, he puts the he call, he calls the curveball. So, but he wanted me to bounce it like on the on the back mm-hmm. corner of the plate. So I went and I actually threw a real good one that bounced, got the swing and miss. He, he get, I mean, he goes down to block it, <laughs> through the wickets it goes, <laughs> run scores, <laughs> and I'm on the mound and he's back. He goes back into uh, in, in the vet and he goes back and he's he picks up the ball. He turns around and he looks still had still had his mask on. I think he goes. <laughs> he shrugs <laughs> and, so, and I'm like we both sort of sort of grinned and laughed about it but a little bit that was you know one of my little funny stories I mean as far as playing yeah you know, with Darren on the field a little light heart and everything you know, the guy had so many knee injuries and stuff like that and he was he was a true uh, I mean leader to the word yeah you know on and off and he gave you confidence to do things and uh, and his knack was I know with me especially to know what kind of stuff I had that day. And we went off. It went, we weren't following a, you know, say to speak, a game plan. Right. We went with what our strengths were, and then you have to adjust on the fly. And that's what he was good at, at knowing and reading us how we were throwing that, what our ball was doing, and calling the game yeah. off that to keep the tempo going, keep the pace to get us in a rhythm to find to find it you know yeah. sometimes you have to hunt and find that he was good at doing that i mean i know shield would say the, the same thing if he was here yeah because you know, we pitched a lot of like but uh, i mean it, he had such a bearing on me as a ball player you yeah know, as a pitcher you know and, and talking with some of the guys he wasn't a perfect player no but he got the most out of everybody else around him too and that, and that was you 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 hit it on the head there there was something about him he challenged I know he challenged me yes to be right. better he challenged me as a person he helped me grow up as a man because I was a younger younger guy when I come here he helped me grow up and get that little bit 
you know, he wasn't afraid to get on you a little bit and, and get that little, you know, pee and vinegar out of you, mm -hmm. you know. And that that's worked. what I think I needed, personally. Some guys have that right off the bat. I had to get that, you know, and, and it started coming with the Braves, but it matured and more when I had – I was so fortunate to have somebody, somebody like them spend the time, come in. You know, it's not just getting on you. He was there to give you a pat on the rear, yeah. too. If you're going to get on somebody, you got to be able to give a pat on the rear. He was, he was that guy. I mean, he was – you know, he had – he'd give you that look and, and come up and he'd – you know, like we always say, the hug and the kiss when you come – into the clubhouse, or you haven't seen him in a little bit, you know, I, that's what I miss about him. You know I mean, it's it's that type of thing. He brought, he, it's like these lights in these rooms right now. It made my day brighter, you know, every time I saw him because there's the smile, you know, the hug and the kiss. And I mean, it was just a pleasure to have known him and played with him. And I'm, I'm proud to be his friend. Well, for the record, you do that for a lot of us too, you by know, the way. I appreciate you, that, you do. Bro. I try, I try, <laughs> you I try do. To, you know, I tried to pay it forward, and I think yeah. I think Dutch was that type of dude too. He tried to give it forward. I remember coming up, you know, when I come over here, if if we went out together or something like that, and if I went to pay for something, he looked at me, he says, "Leave your wallet in your pocket." He says, "We take care of you. You pay it forward to the young guys, yeah. and when you get older too." And I mean, that's the type of person he was. You know, he just, you know, he he did that with everybody. Yeah, so love it. Thanks, Tommy. You got it, pal. Thanks for having me. All right, here with uh, Von Hayes. And uh, Von, I know you had a, a special relationship with Darren, not only as part of your baseball life, but but away from the field. You guys spend a lot of time together down in Clearwater, and, uh, you know, you got to know Darren on a different level, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, um, we we had golf matches. Darren would always bring in somebody, and we'd play scramble and two-man scramble, that kind of thing. And uh, we were never teammates, but so we are always going against each other. But... Uh, <laughs> And you would never, you won't meet a more competitive person than, than, than Darren Dalton. And uh, he's just a very good friend, and, and obviously missed by by not only his teammates but but the community as well. And uh, um, it's, he's, this is just such an awesome format that they put together here, yeah. um, and it's great to be a part of it. Yeah, not a surprise that uh, winning, no matter what he was doing, winning was important to Darren, and not not in a way that was in your face and, and arrogant about it, but it, but he believed that winning was the ultimate, right? I mean, yeah. whether it be golf or baseball or, or whatever he was doing, even when I worked with him in, in the television side of things, he wanted to be the best television analyst that he could be. Yeah. Uh, that was Darren, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it wasn't, you know, most of us, you know, we're, we're professional baseball players. So winning is a huge part of our life sure. when we're playing through this, you know, the championship season. But Darren would take it further. I mean, he would uh, on the golf course. He wanted to. He wanted to be the best he can be golfing. So yeah. like, you know, if if you tied him one day and he gave you three three strokes, or you played him up even or whatever, the next day he was going to give you four strokes or five strokes to try to push himself. You know, that's the type of person he was, which was. Which was fine with me. I mean, if he wanted to give away his money, that was great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll take it if, if he's going to give it away. No. Awesome, awesome there, stuff. There was a, there was a there was a time one time I, I you know we were um, just finished a round and he asked me if I wanted wanted to play in a, a food lion tournament in North Carolina. You know, it was a celebrity event that he had played in a few years and they needed some celebrities. I said, yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. So I go down there with them, and they had a, they had a closest to the pin for the celebrities, and they had prizes. Like, I think one of them was a Wave Runner. They had a Harley Davidson, nice. yeah. and and um, and a um, and him and I, Darren and I went out to dinner last that the night before, and, and we had a nice time and had a couple, you know, what he would call social sparklers, <laughs> it, you know. So we just had a, had a great time and may, maybe feeling it a little bit the next day, right? And so. Um, I, I ended up hitting a six iron about three feet from the hole and walked away with an 18 foot boat. Wow! And Darren, <laughs> and Darren was so so ticked off because I'd, I already had a I already had a boat, you know, at my house, and he's going, "Man, I can't believe I didn't win." That so, is great. He, he was just so competitive and such such a good man. Absolutely, no, that's what we remember for sure. Bon, thanks yeah. so much. It was good All to right. see you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Scott Ayer has joined us now, and uh, now you never played with Darren, but you got an opportunity at fantasy camp to get to know Dutch a little bit. Uh, what was that story all about? Well, like everyone, the first time they meet him, it's memorable. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, so we're standing in the locker room, you know, getting ready for our day at fantasy camp. Ricky Jordan's right next to me, and I think Izzy was to the other side of me. 
and he this guy walks in and I, I go I go I elbow Ricky I go that's Darren Dalton right I said and he goes yeah yeah I go oh what an awesome player he was okay so I'm like I have always a fan of the game. We've sure. told you before yeah. in the past. Like, I got starstruck beating other players, but I, I knew what type of player he was, even not playing with him, you know, playing against him. Or not, I didn't even play against him. I think I was a, just a little after him. Yeah. But you hear the stories and this and that. So he goes around. He's saying hi to everybody. You know, when, when Booney, who sits in his seat all morning, never gets up, gets up to hug him, man, you're like, oh, man. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. it. You see things like that, and he gets, to, he gets down the line. He goes by Tommy Green, he get Ricky talking to Ricky, and he looks at me, and he looks, I see him look over my head at my name tag, and he goes, Scotty Air. And it only says Air up there. So he knew my first name somehow, which is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he you knew in that voice, Scotty Air. The man leaned in for a hug and a kiss on the cheek, and I'm like, uh, hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> Holy crap. You got the like, full Dalton treatment. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and then I heard stories. It's kind of funny, like that fantasy. I think it was my second year of fantasy camp, so like maybe 2011. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, I hear all these stories about how he would meet fans at a bar or yeah. at, meet fans, you know, at a, at, a, at a subway or somewhere after a game or whatnot. And that's how he treated everybody. I just thought, man, nobody can actually be like that. And then when I, he did it to me, the friend, I'm like, okay, yeah. that's exactly how he was. So that's my, and like when I told my kids that I was coming up for the tournament, my son actually sent me a Snapchat yesterday. He goes, why are you in Philly? And I said to Darren Dalton, he goes, oh, I remember him. He was so cool. Now, even my kids, and they were just at Fantasy Camp to like run the bases and stuff and hang out. And they remembered who he was, yeah. like just from me talking about him. So. That's the thing about, about Darren, and, uh, you know, I met him after well, – I, I covered that team a little bit, but I really got to know him later uh, after he had retired. And people would say, no one can, no one can really be like that all the time. But, and, and he was, how and it was hard, so genuine. You and, think about how hard yeah. it is to be like that. I think I'm a pretty positive, outgoing yeah, person. myself too, yeah. I have and, my moments where I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> and he never seemed like he had no. those. It was always like he's in a pissed off mood or whatever, and all of a sudden, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Like he could turn that back on like that, and that's, that's special. So yeah. like for him to be taken by the crap he had to deal with is, in my opinion, it really sucks. But yeah. what are you going to do, you know? And he, I don't think it ever bothered him. He, even the last – year he was at fantasy camp he was still sitting at the bar drinking and having a great old time like the life of the party like every it's so funny when certain people you know when certain people start talking and telling a story like i was in a clubhouse one time with the giants we started a spring training game and willie mays is in there telling stories <laughs> so nobody left to go to right. the dugout and you know felipe alou sticks his head in and goes hey willie stop we gotta go you know it's the same type of thing like when yeah. darren started telling a story everybody stopped and listened and no one said a word they just listened yeah you know that's 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 respect, and whew, yeah. gives me chills. And, and me too. And and the <laughs> thing about Dutch is, you know, we obviously lost him way too soon. But man, oh man, did he he enjoyed every moment that he I, had. I, and, I uh, hope that was if, great. If I was facing something as inevitable as as basically passing away as he was, that I could stay. I really do. I might get emo like hope I could stay that positive. Yeah. Like holy crap, you know, that's what kind of special person does it take to stay that positive all the time? No one. It's going to be over at some point soon. Yeah. Like, what? And that's why we're still talking about him today? Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. why this many people show up for Thanks. such a cool golf yeah. and bartending. Bartending last night was fun, too. <laughs> it was indeed. I don't, I'm not comfortable around the bar, but I, I, too many people for me. I like standing in the corner and kind of being the quiet one. But yeah. um, It was fun. It oh, was man. Fun. A lot, so many people come out, and everybody, everybody out here has a different story from when they watched him play when they were younger yep. or, you know, this and that. And, oh, I met him. You know, at a at a Kroger one time, like, and he probably gave him a hug in the middle of the grocery store for goodness sake. You know, like probably it's just did. it's kind of cool. Yeah, Scott, thanks so much. My pleasure. I'm here with Ricky Jordan, and uh, you think back to memories with Darren Dalton, uh, 1988, your rookie year. Uh, you're getting a chance to play first base, obviously, touch out there, and uh, not everything goes right in baseball. Baseball can be a humbling sport. What do you What do you remember about that? It definitely can be humbling. Uh, I remember in 88, I came up with the Phillies, hit a few home runs, thought I was all that, uh, <laughs> thought I had conquered the game, you know, and, it, and the game was easy at the MLB level. And uh, I just remember one night we were playing the Cubs at the vet, and it was a ground ball to first, you know, a double play. I touched the base and throw wide home to, uh, to home plate, to Dutch. And um, Andre Dawson was running from third, comes sliding in the Dutch yeah. real hard as the ball's – I threw it too high and so I'm thinking uh he's safe and I'm thinking Dutch is going to be pretty upset with me because uh he's got these knees that's been operated on for so many years you know what I mean so I thought he was going to be upset with me and get mad at me but the fans booed me so <laughs> I was a little worried that he would he would get upset too 
But after the inning was over, we went uh, into the dugout. He came up to me and said, hey, Rook, it's okay. If you continue to play up here and play this game, there's going to be many more failures in this game. So I just think it was so encouraging for him to say that because I was flustered, you know, got booed and, and was a little bit down. But for him to come over and not think about himself and uh, have words of encouragement for me, uh, it, was, it was very good for me. Yeah, is it fair to say about Dutch, because we've heard stories uh, about Darren having to get in guys' faces as teammates, and, and, and then, and then you, we hear this story. Darren had a knack for knowing exactly what button to push when, and when to push it, right? Whether it be good or bad. Exactly. I mean, if you, if you went out and uh, did something out there on the field that you shouldn't be doing or you were showing lack of effort, all he had to do sometimes was give you that look, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. And, and he was a warrior. When he was on that field, he was a warrior. I mean, but the sweetest guy off of it, give you that hug, give you that kiss, you know what I mean? I always greeted you like that. But you knew, I mean, he, he would get up in your face. It didn't matter who you were. I mean, and I was one of the nicest guys on the team, and he, he's giving me the look like yeah. you didn't make an effort after that ball or something. You know, you need to get on the page with us. We're trying to win games here. Ricky Jordan, good to see you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Murph. Hey everyone, Murph here, and the Parks Sportsbook app is the official sportsbook partner of the real Philly sports fan. Bet on it all. Baseball, golf, MMA, and more. Live in-game play-by-play betting lets you bet while you watch. No better way to bet right now than the Parks Sportsbook app. The only sportsbook app backed by the number one casino in Pennsylvania, and the only one I recommend. No one does live in-game play-by-play betting better. Bet the money line as it changes during the game on the Park Sportsbook app. Plus, bet on individual player performances. In baseball, you can bet on hits, home runs, and pitcher strikeouts every inning. How about golf? You can bet on match winners, bet on leaders after rounds, and more. New customers sign up right now and get your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use promo code ACTION. Do it now. Your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use that promo code ACTION. The website has all the details. Get game previews, podcasts, and more on Twitter at Parks Sportsbook. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade, whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go, delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. Randy Wolf has joined us now, and uh, so many folks have memories of Darren uh, down in Florida, in Clearwater. Obviously, he was he spent a lot of time down there, and uh, and you guys as well. Um, and it's almost everybody has that story where you see Darren out in public, you see him over at the ballpark, and he just just always made everyone feel good. Did he not? No, I mean, uh, you know, for me, it was it was an interesting thing for me because I just missed Darren as a player. I yeah. got called up in 99. I think his last year was, oh, what, 96? 97. Yeah. 97, yeah. 97. Mm-hmm. He got traded in 97, mm-hmm. right, to the Marlins. And um, I came up in 99. I think I met him in 98 or 99 in spring training. You know, the, in, in, uh, in Clearwater, there's a few restaurants that you kind of mingle in. And the one thing that I think everybody knows about Darren – the first time you meet him, he's going to give you a kiss on the cheek, <laughs> yes, man. Yes, he is. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like an instant, like, it's a shock at first if you're not used to it. And you're like, what just happened? I mean, every single woman I knew growing up, like, had a crush on this guy, <laughs> you know? Like, all these older women, like Darren Dalton was, like, their guy, right. you know? And then all of a sudden, he gave me a kiss on the cheek. I'm like, does that make me, like, like retroactively hot because Darren Dalton gave me a kiss on the cheek. I could use this. I could use this, but, um, but no. And then, uh, you get to know him over the years, uh, being a Philly of uh, whether he's in Philadelphia or or you see him in Clearwater. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing because as, as I've gotten older and learned like what happened with the 93 team Mm -hmm. and how he was when I met him in 99 and, and, and on, you know, this whole idea of love, like, like he, every time I saw him after that, he would, he would give me a kiss on the cheek. 
love you, Wolfie. Yeah. Love you, Wolfie. And then um, I, I heard about when Crucky gave his speech at um, his his funeral, talking about how he introduced like love into the clubhouse with those mix of like complete degenerates, and um, and it was genuine. Yes. Like I just remember how he was genuinely like, you know, you know, you'd walk away from him and see him at like you know Island Grill or whatever was in Clearwater and. You know, you talk to him for a little bit, have a drink with him, have dinner. And then it was like, all right, man, I'll see you. Hey, I love you, Wolfie. And you're like, and, and, and for me, I love you, man. Like, it was yeah. weird to say that, but like, it was a genuine thing. And, and it was something that wasn't lost on everybody who met and really interacted with Darren. Um, and they, that went on until I remember, I, I, I believe that the last alumni weekend was when I was there and uh, just talking to him outside and, and just the whole thing. And it was at the hotel with yeah. a few drinks and it was, um, you know, it, it, it was something that I always remember just how he was, the, the, the connection that he really drew on people and drew on me. Um, it was it was pretty pretty damn cool. Yeah, and uh, you don't forget those things. The word that get, keeps coming up as we're sitting here doing and, and talking to you guys is genuine because it's so hard for folks that never got a chance to meet Darren to understand that he was like that. I mean, we see them as the rough and tumble kind of player, but he had so much love for all the people that he interacted with, and it was so real. It was. If, if he said it to you, which he did, and I could see it in your face, yeah. you knew he meant it, and that's what makes it special. But it, may, it was weird. Yeah, it was well, weird. Yeah. I, I'm like, I'm because like, we're, we're not used to that. I never, I never played with you, right. and, and and I was a Philly, but I never played with you, and I actually never played against you. And and by the time I was in the big leagues, you retired, and and yeah, I was a Philly, but but we went out to dinner, and and um, I saw him at you know certain places, and. But it was it was a genuine it wasn't it was that's the weird thing. It wasn't a disingenuous kind of like no. hey I love you man. It right. was like it was like you looked at he would like uh, like lock eyes where you're like Make no mistake. This right. is real. And yeah. it was like and, and if you weren't used to it, it was like oh, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah. And then as you got to know him more and more and, and you and over the years it was it, you could tell it was a very genuine thing and and um and I still, I, I still recall like the one of the last alumni weekends with him, and just, just how he was so genuine about it. And um, uh, you, you think it was because he had this, uh, this call to his, his, um, his demise, right? Yeah. And you yeah. think, like, oh, that's what was why, happening. right? But it wasn't. Like he was that way before all that stuff, which, right. which, which makes it, which makes it so much more. Uh, semi-ironic you know yeah. um and 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 so much more genuine as to his call to closeness with the people that were in his world yeah um and uh and it, not just ball players it wasn't just no his team. no no it was anybody thing. in a circle anybody in the in the circle widened i'm right. sure with, with his life yeah. as it as it as it grew and you know as me as, as somebody who was a uh you know you know, I, I looked at big league ball players as closed off and and um, and and very kind of like against closeness and me meeting him before he was in the big leagues. I'm like, oh man, this guy kind of you know was so cool with me. And then I you know my first year in the big leagues, and he was you know just that how he yeah. was. It was just it was it's pretty it's pretty amazing um, how close he felt to at least how he melt how he made me feel as close to him yes. yeah whether that was as a way of of uh connection or just the way he was either way it didn't matter you know it was just really cool yeah you, it's funny you said it, it was awkward and and i get that um but it was only awkward for the first our, time. And, and for our side for him it was never awkward for yeah. him yeah because it just came out of him it bubbled yeah. out of him and oh man he yeah. was a let me tell you what, if, if, if you knew Darren Dalton, 
you were kissed on the cheek. That's the truth. He was the Morgana of cheekness. <laughs> you know what I mean? He would love to hear that. He would love that. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And that's why there's so many people here today celebrating him. Randy, good to see you. Thanks Greg, for stopping uh, by. Awesome, man. Thank okay. you very much. And we're here with Dave Holland, so of course, a teammate of Darren in uh, 1993 and, and that special season that we still talk about in Philadelphia uh, continuously. And I know you have so many memories and stories of Dutch, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that relationship that you had with him because uh, good and bad, right? Because that's the kind of guy he was. He, was, mostly, he held everyone accountable. Mostly good. This is audio, right? Yeah. Not just No video? Okay. Well, we do it, yeah. We got video, all right. No makeup crew anymore, huh? No, no. Good. At the low budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told my story. I had one run in with Dutch uh, early in my career. Well, actually, it was 93, the opening day. I talked about it earlier. But that's the way he was. I mean, he, he handled stuff. A lot of guys don't want to deal with team stuff. They're too busy worrying about their own career right. and performing and taking care of themselves. It's not easy to worry about all the other guys in the clubhouse who are maybe not pulling the rope the same way every, every night or whatever comes up during a long season. But we talked about mine earlier, uh, opening day, uh, second, first series at Houston, the last game, punching out three times and yeah. we swept them and not acting the right way after yeah, the game. Yeah, you, you were unhappy with your performance, yeah. but the team had won all three. And yeah, and Dutch, he handled that with me and... and it never happened again in my career. How about and that? it was the right way to handle it. He was ready to confront me man to man physically the next day at home before the home opener. And I felt like shit because of it. You know, I knew I was in the wrong. And, and the same thing with Inky the time uh, he got tired of, you know, guys talking trash to the pitchers. Either go to first base or go get him, he used to tell us. I don't want no John at home, and we go out and do a little dance out there. <laughs> Either you go get him or you go to first base. Well, it happened again, and Dutch said, after the game, you and me in the clubhouse. I'll see you in the clubhouse after the game. Well, that was the night Dutch took one off the collarbone and, and broke on a foul tip. Yeah. Frankie, you remember that? <laughs> and and that, that never happened, but... I'll tell you what. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, when you Inky think about... got the message. Yeah, and I think about 93... Just like I got the message, right. and it never happened again. He was not afraid to confront no. you, and, and no. you weren't exactly a, a pushover. You were a tough guy, and Inky, big guy, tough guy, you know? It didn't but matter, it didn't matter, It didn't right? matter who you were, and, and that's the type of leader he was, and, it, and a lot of guys don't want to do that. Yeah. They don't want to risk their own career or be bothered with it because it's hard enough, you know, for a lot of guys just to play there and, and yeah. stay there in the major league. So that's what made him so special. That's a really interesting perspective that it, it's hard to be a leader and, and it it's hard to play baseball. It's hard enough and, and yeah. to take that on too. But yeah. that's what Dutch did and he did it as well as anybody ever. Absolutely. Yeah. Dave How Hollins, about? good to see you. All right, Murph. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, we're really pleased to have the president of the Darren Dalton Foundation, Brett Datto, to, uh, with us here, uh, talking about great memories of, of Dutch. Now, you've known Dutch for a long, long time, and um, you got to know him professionally, but then obviously personally as well, right? Yeah, I first met Darren in 1994 and uh, had the opportunity to uh, you know, represent him professionally and then uh, you know, kept in touch with him over the years, did some uh, work for him, and then in 2013, when he was diagnosed, unfortunately, with uh, the glioblastoma, he, he and Amanda came to me, asked me to take over the presidency of the foundation, and uh, you know, we've been uh, doing this for the last eight years, and uh, you know, because of people that uh, Darren has touched, like uh, you know, his teammates, John mm -hmm. Crook, Mickey Morandini, Danny Jackson, um, Don Carmen, Andrew Knapp, who um, you know we just uh, forged a relationship with. The mission of the foundation to help people has been able to carry on just because of who Darren was. Yeah. So, in your mind, who who was Darren Dalton? I How mean, would you best describe? I mean, obviously, you know, when when he passed, you heard all the stories about just what a, a great leader he was, and I, I I always knew Darren obviously to be a leader of the of the uh, Phillies and his teammates, but I got to know him on a more personal level. Uh, throughout the 25 years that I knew him. And uh, he was just a fan favorite. I mean, he was just so beloved. Anybody he met, Greg, I mean, he would go up to them and uh, or they would go up to him. He would give them a kiss. He'd give them a hug. Um, he'd 
you know, do photographs, autographs. Yeah. He never said no to anybody. And that's what I'll always remember about Darren Dalton. But it was not just the, the public face of Darren Dalton with the fans because uh, he was wonderful with them. But when, when you were his friend, he would go out of his way to make sure that you knew you were special. Uh, he, he certainly did that for you and, and your kids in Little League. Uh, tell, tell us that story. Yeah, I mean, I, in 2008, when the Phillies were in the World Series, he was down in uh, Clearwater. It was like February. And he was asking how my boys were doing. I told him they were great, just getting ready for Little League opening day in April. He said, what's the opening day? I said, April 6th. He goes, where? I said, in Philly. He goes, well, I'll be up there. I'll throw out the first pitch for you. And awesome. he came up. We had 700 families for opening day, and he threw out the first pitch, and he stayed there. I mean, these kids didn't even know who he was, but it was like a, it was like a, a legend walking into the uh, Little League complex. And he stayed for four hours that day and just, you know, took photos with the kids, yeah. played a little catch with some of the kids. And all the families were there and taking photographs and autographs. So, I mean, that's that's he, he was just such a kind, special person. And that's the why we have the kind of day we have today. It's been unbelievable. I mean, the, the support that we get from not only, you know, the sponsors, but anybody who was a fan or anybody who got to know Darren and, and just, you know, the, the special place that he, they, that he put into everybody's heart it was just amazing. So we get this type of outing with 225 golfers. It's absolutely amazing. And we grew it from uh, 100 golfers our yeah. first year in 2013 to now 225 golfers. And we're doing over 27 holes. I mean, it's really just remarkable. And uh, we're just grateful for uh, all the support we get. Congratulations on a great day. It was Thanks, awesome. Greg. It's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. And we're here with Frank Hopenbarger, who is the uh, longtime traveling secretary and equipment manager for the Philadelphia Phillies, just retired uh, a few years back. Uh, certainly good to see you. And I know uh, you have some great memories, uh, not only of Darren, but that 93 team. You came over from the Cardinals in 1989, or right after the, right. yeah, and, uh, and, and started with the Philadelphia Phillies. And, you know, that was a tough clubhouse from time to time back then, was it not? Yeah, I used to say they were like the Oakland Raiders, the old Oakland Raiders of baseball. <laughs> Those guys were, they were a handful. I mean, uh, and, and Darren, you know, was, was a leader right out of the gate. But, but for me, you know, I came from St. Louis and the general manager came from there. And, you know, you never know if you can trust the, yeah. the guy or not. So I was that guy and kind of had to ride the fence and had to prove myself. And uh, fortunately, I was around Darren for a number of years, and I had the opportunity to do that and earn his his trust and his respect, uh, so much so that when he got traded to the Marlins, I actually wrote him a letter and told him that it was one of the highlights of my baseball career that I could say that I earned his respect, and I stuck it in his duffel bag when he went to Florida. Did he ever uh, respond to that? Oh, he, yeah. It, we, yeah, you know, over the phone, I got your note. It meant a lot, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. But, but he was a uh, he had such a presence about him. I mean, he and Jim Fregosi and Dallas Green are three people that when they walk in a room, just everybody looks at them. And yeah, you know, he was he was at way in the clubhouse. Um, for me, you know, I have a lot of bosses when I was working in yeah. the clubhouse. Every player, all the coaches, a manager, and it's hard to please everybody and. Every once in a while, it would get a little bit testy in there, but Darren always had my back, and I really appreciated that. And, and if, if I needed to really go to him to, to say a word to somebody, it was done. And, right. you know, not out loud or anything else, but I never had any more problems. So, you, you know. know, it's funny because we hear, obviously, we hear the stories player to player, coach to player. Um, but, you know, there's such a, uh, a support system in Major League Baseball, beginning with the guys inside the clubhouse that are the equipment manager, the, the guys that are working in there. And they are every bit of as, as important as everybody else that's in that clubhouse. But sometimes you need someone like Darren to make sure that everyone understands that, right? Uh, correct. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a big job. It's a lot of details. And, and you know, you're... You're sort of like an umpire, you know. If you're if you're having a good game, they don't notice exactly. you. But if if one little thing goes wrong, then you know it's magnified. <laughs> and you're the bad guy. But uh, he had a good head on his shoulders, and he always, uh, you know, he always understood. And and if you just talk to him about the situation, you know, he would he would have your back for sure. But uh, he was he was a remarkable person. Great great guy to be around. I'm thrilled that I was able to be his friend and, and work with him so many years. Frank, it's uh, good to see you. Always good to see you. Always good to see you, Murph. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, we sure hope you enjoyed that special edition of Glove Stories with Murph, celebrating the life and legacy of Darren Dalton here at the Darren Dalton Foundation 8th Annual Golf Tournament, uh, hearing from his teammates uh, and the guys that uh, he touched in so many different ways. It was really a lot of fun, certainly a lot of fun for us. We hope it was a lot of fun for you. Uh, we are in between Major League Baseball seasons, but that does not mean that the podcast is going away. We hope to have a couple of more specials over the offseason and then rejoin you again uh, in spring training and start glove stories with murph season two coming up so we appreciate your support this year and we hope to talk to you soon we hope you enjoyed this edition of glove stories with murph brought to you by the parks casino sportsbook app and the great folks at red robin Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and Red Robin and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.